Hey, fifth grade, it's Mrs. Utsi, and I am here ready to read to you guys chapter eight of The Watsons Go to Birmingham. So here we go. Chapter eight, The Ultra Glide. I don't know why we didn't catch on that something different was really going to happen this time. Mama and dad started acting real strange right after they talked to Grandma Sands. First, Mama started writing in a notebook and adding things up and subtracting things. Then Dad and Joey and Rufus and me started driving all over Flint buying things for the Brown Bomber. We stopped at Genesee Junkyard and bought a new antenna for the radio and four new used tires. Then we stopped at Mr. Biller's garage and had the tires put on the car. Then we stopped at the Yankee store and bought some spark plugs and some oil and antifreeze. Then we got our next door neighbor, Mr. Johnson, to help put all that stuff in the car. Then we washed and waxed the brown bomber. When Byron walked by while we were working on it, he said, y'all done real good. It still looks like a turd on wheels, but I gotta admit, now it looks like a polished turd. We ignored him. While Joey cleaned the windows, me and Rufus washed the seats, even the parts that were torn and worn away. But the more we washed them, the worse they looked. And dad ended up going back to the Yankee store and buying some brown and white seat covers for the front seat. The brown bomber looked great. Not almost new, but not almost 15 years old either. We brought mama out and showed it to her. And she gave us one of those big hand over her mouth smiles. Well, folks, dad said, and we all knew he was getting ready to cut up. All it needs now is that final touch, that special something that sets it apart from all the other buckets of bolts on the road, that one piece of all-American engineering that shows that its fine automobile is worthy of the name Brown Bomber. Any guesses as to what that is? A new hood thing, I asked. The thing in the middle of the hood was a long chrome rocket that pointed out over the road. The only thing that was wrong with it was that one of the wings of the rocket was broken off. Like with everything else, Dad had a crazy explanation for that. He told us that right after he got the car from Uncle Bud, both wings were there, but that he had taken it to a special garage and had one wing scientifically and mathematically taken off. When we asked him why, he told us that that way, when we came back from a long trip, we'd be coming in on a wing in a prayer. That's the kind of junk dad thinks is funny. No, dad answered my question. It's not a new hood thing. The one on there now is perfectly fine. Joey, what's your guess? I don't know, daddy. I don't think anything can make the bomber any better. I think it's perfect. Bless you, sweetheart. Rufus, your turn. What do you think? I don't know, Mr. Watson. I like y'all's car just fine. I knew there was something I liked about that boy. All right, Malona, what's your guess? I don't know either, Mama said and rolled her eyes. I think the car is per, per, per. Mama was cutting up too. Oh my God, I can't say it. Real cute, Malona. Well, since Kenneth and Mama have insulted the great brown one, I guess that leaves it up to Rufus and Pumpkin to put the final piece on. Dad handed the keys to Rufus. Rufus, you open the trunk and pumpkin. There's a small bag in there. You have the honor of putting what's inside of it on. Rufus popped the trunk open and Joey took a small paper bag out. She turned her back to everyone and looked inside. Oh, daddy, I love it. Do you know where it goes? Yes, daddy. Okay, time's a wasting. Put it on. She put her hand in the bag and without pulling it out said, and now the thing that makes this car more perfect. Dad started helping Joey cut up. He said, the final touch. Joey repeated, the final touch, the height of technology, the height of technology, the ultimate in American knowledge, the ultimate in American knowledge. Mama couldn't take it anymore. For God's sake, Daniel, what is it? It's the pinnacle of Western civilization. It's the pinnacle of Western civilization. Now, Joey, dazzle them, girl. 
Joey pulled her hand out of the bag and said, it's a smelly green pine tree. Mama went, ugh, and walked back into the house. Joey hung the smelly green pine tree from the rear view mirror and scooted out of the car to let me and Rufus smell her fingers. But dad wasn't through adding things to the brown bomber. On Saturday morning, Joey and me got up real early to watch cartoons and dad was already up brushing his teeth and shaving. I went into the bathroom to watch him. I love the way that shaving soap smells. Hi, Dad. Morning, Kenny. How'd you sleep? Dad said this with his toothbrush in his mouth. Okay, I guess. Then Dad pulled one of his famous tricks on me. He said, Kenny, look, and pointed in the hallway. Even before I could think, my head turned around and I followed Dad's finger. When I saw nothing and looked back at dad, was smiling a mile a minute, acting like he hadn't done anything, but I noticed that his toothbrush was gone. I let him know he didn't fool me. Dad, how come you always hide your toothbrush? Why don't you keep yours with ours? Dad laughed. Well, Kenny, I guess I don't keep my toothbrush with the rest of yours because unlike your mother, I was a little boy once. I thought about this for a second and said, what does that mean? Dad picked up my toothbrush and said, look at this. Not only is this instrument perfect for brushing teeth, it has other wonderful uses too. You see, Kenny, I know that in a little boy's eyes, there isn't anything in the world that is better for general cleaning than a toothbrush. And the greatest thing about it is that with a good rinse afterwards, no one can tell what it was used for. I also know that the best toothbrush for cleaning stuff is always someone else's. So rather than wondering what my toothbrush last cleaned, I think it's better that it only goes places that I know about. Dad was right. I caught Byron using mine once to shine up some quarters and another time to brush Blackie's teeth. I didn't really care, but Blackie didn't like it. That was the only time he ever growled at someone in his own family. Dad was stirring the soap dish up with his shaving brush, and I got close to the sink to smell the soap. Dad painted his face with soap, then bent down to, and rinsed it off. I know it sounds crazy, but he always did this twice. He said it really made your beard super soft. He learned that because he used to work in a barber shop when he was a little boy. That's where he also learned that if you go to the barber shop, you've got to make, your, make sure your neck is real clean. Otherwise, the barber talks about you like a dog after you leave. So, Dad said as he put the second coat of soap on his face, let me guess why you're standing so close. Could it be that you want me to soap your face up and hold you up here while you shave it off? It's been a long time since we've done that. Oh man, I'm way too old for that. Besides, I'm starting to get a real mustache. Look, I stuck my upper lip, lip out for Dad to see. Where? Dad leaned down and looked real hard. I can't see it. Here, look. Maybe if you get closer to the light. Dad bent over and picked me up to the mirror. I automatically turned my head sideways when I saw my reflection. Some of the time, I forgot all about my lazy eye. Well, I don't believe it. If you squint your eyes and look real hard, there's no doubt about it. This boy's got a real mustache going here. I didn't know if dad really could see it or not, but I knew it was there. He put me down. Won't be long before you and I have to share the mirror in the morning, huh? I couldn't help it. Even though I knew he might be kidding, I broke out in a real big smile and nodded my head up and down. Dad started shaving. Well, just so there are no problems, I've got seniority on you. So I get the bathroom first. Deal? Deal. When dad finished, he asked me, you too old for a little old spice? He slapped the cologne on me and said, I don't want your mother to know I put this aftershave on you. What with you smelling so good and this new mustache coming out, I don't want her blaming me when all these little girls start attacking you. I twisted my face up. We walked into the living room to watch cartoons, but when we got there, dad kept going and said, if your mother gets up before I'm back, just tell her I won't be long. Where you going, Daddy? Joey asked. Dad gave his famous answer, out, and closed the door behind him. Dad missed Felix the Cat, Soupy Sales, Beanie and Cecil, The Ray Dean Show, and Betty Boop. 
He missed Mama getting up and Byron getting up. When he finally got back, we were all sitting on the couch watching the worst cartoon ever made, Clutch Cargo. Dad walked in and turned the TV off. Dad! Sorry, kids. Everybody's got to come outside right now. You too, Daddy-O. And you too, Malona. I've got a surprise. Dad made us stop at the front door and get in a line, one behind the other. Mama first, then Byron, then me, then Joey. Except for ball-headed by, we were all laughing and wondering what Dad's surprise was when he opened the door. Following Dad, we walked down the front porch steps and stood on the sidewalk like a little parade. I bet the neighbors wondered what the weird Watsons were doing this time. All right, Dad said. When I say it, I want everybody to close their eyes, and I'm warning you, anyone who looks before I tell you to is going to get it. My eyes, of course, would be sealed. If a bomb exploded under me, I'd be standing in a hole with my eyes sealed. Even if my head got blown off, they'd have to say, here's that kid's head, and yep, his eyes are locked tight as a safe. Byron said I was stupid for listening to everything that Mama and Dad said. But if I was so stupid, why was he the one who had a great big bald shiny knotted up head? Dad said, okay, now hold the person in front of you by the shoulders. Walona, you hold on to mine. This is only going to take a minute. He said that last part because mama rolled her eyes and was real close to stopping everything by turning around and going back into the house. All right, close them. Mama gave him her last straw look and closed her eyes. Then so did we. Dad shuffled us ahead a little bit and then we all stopped. It was real hard not to pee. Okay, keep them shut. I'm not playing. I heard a car door open, heard a loud pop, then heard Byron say, oh man. Me and Joey cracked up. We knew a certain person had peeked and got popped. Right smack jab on that bald head. Finally, Dad said, that's it. Open your eyes. What do you think? Dad had opened the driver's side of the brown bomber and was standing with one arm pointing the way inside. In the middle of the dashboard, to the right of the steering wheel, something real big was sticking out. Dad had taken one of our giant towels and set it over the thing. Everybody stood there staring. Finally, Mama said, Daniel, what on earth is that towel doing in there? The towel is fine, Malona. Aren't you wondering what's underneath it? Yeah, Dad, what is that thing? I asked. Well, Kenneth, since you seem to be the only one with any curiosity, I guess you'll be the one who gets to unveil the bomber's latest addition. I crawled into the front seat and raised a corner of the towel so no one but me could see what was under it. I couldn't believe it. Dad, it's great! The rest of them, Byron included, crowded up to the brown bomber's door. Mama had a worried voice. What have you done to this car now? Daniel, what's under that towel? I grabbed a corner of the towel. Ladies and gentle, Byron interrupted me when he saw I was going to tease them. He said, oh man, just pull the blank towel off so I can get out of here. I ain't got all day to listen to your mess. He was always in a hurry to get out of someplace, but never had anywhere else to go. Byron, how many times have I told you about saying ain't? And Kenneth, you stop playing and move that towel this minute, Mama said. I talked real fast before Mama could get any matter. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest addition to the brown bomber. I whipped the towel aside, our very own drive around record player. Mama went, oh my God, and gave Daddy a dirty look, then walked back into the house. Joey squealed, oh boy. Even cool old Brian forgot how cool he was and screamed out, oh man, this is too, too hip. No one's got one of these. Speedy don't even have one in his Cadillac. Too much, man, way too much. Joey and Byron climbed into the car on either side of me. Way, we all said, turn it on, daddy. I knew dad was kind of disappointed by the way mama had acted. She really hurt his feelings by walking off like that. Some of the time, I think she forgot how sensitive Dad was. Even though he acted cheery with us, I knew it wasn't the same from now. 
I knew if mama had stayed and hadn't gone off mumbling about money, we would have been having a lot more fun. But dad forgot all this stuff real quick and got excited about showing off the record player. Dad was like me. He loved putting on a show. Or as mama said, we both loved acting the fool. Dad was the best at it, though, and I couldn't wait until I was as good as he was. Well, 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 Dad said, leaning down into the car. I see you three have the ultimate in taste. I see you've chosen the top of the line, the cream of the crop, the True Tone AB700 model, the Ultra Glide. We had two, because right on the front of the record player in big red letters, it said TTAB700 Ultra Glide. As I'm certain you are aware, the problem in the past with this new technology and automotive sound has been road vibrations interfering with an accurate dispersal of the phonic interpretations. Huh? Byron said. Dad said, in other words, I'm sure you know that in the good old days, every time you drove over a bump with one of these things, the needle would jump in the scra- and scratch the record. Me and Joy played along. We know, we know. And as I'm sure such a fine, intelligent-looking family as this one, it is Mr. and Mrs. Watson and your son, isn't it? Oh, no, Joetta said and pointed at Byron. This isn't our son. This is just a little juvenile delinquent boy that we feel sorry for and let follow us around some of the time. Our real son has hair. Even this didn't bother Byron, who was amazed by the Brown Bomber's latest edition. Dad kept imitating the guy who sold him the record player. Yes, as I'm sure a nice family like this one is aware, it was only last year that the scientists at Autronic Industries made a brilliant, beautiful, breathtaking breakthrough and developed a suitable system for controlling these vibrations. Yeah, I said. I saw it last night on the news. Walter Cronkite said it was a miracle. Dad laughed. Precisely, Mr. Watson. Walt has two of these babies in his car and one on his motorcycle. We know, we know. Yes, the vibration problem has been overcome by the exclusive vibro-dynamic lateral anti-inertial dampening system. Dad had memorized that word because right on the arm of the record player it said VDLAI dampening patent. Come on, Daddy, turn it on. Stop teasing. Now, now, Mrs. Watson, be patient and tell that little delinquent that follows you around that if he touches one more knob on that record player, I'm going to pull his fingers off. Byron mumbled and sat back in the seat. Before I dazzle you with the symphonic sound of this unit, let me point out some of his less appreciated features. Oh, please do. Oh, man, just turn the blank thing on. If I got to listen to all this drive, I'm going to go in the house and get some real cool sounds. Byron opened the passenger door and ran into the house. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Watson, I'd like to direct your attention to the rear of your classic automobile. Me and Joey crawled up on the back seat and looked at the back window. On the rear shelf, a hole had been cut and was covered with that same stuff that's on a screen door. I can see you're wondering what that is. Well. Let me explain. What we have here is, believe it or not, a second speaker. And I can tell by that intelligent look on your face, Mrs. Watson, that you have grasped that that speaker is not placed in the rear deck haphazardly. No, ma'am. Some people think we just have a hole hacked in back there by an old mechanic, but nothing could be further from the truth. That opening is scientifically and mathematically positioned by a factory trained technician to enhance the TTAB 700's true high fidelity sound. Wow. Byron exploded through the front door with an armful of 45s and mama right on his tail. Byron Watson, don't you stomp on those stairs like that and don't you slam that screen door. She trailed Byron all the way to the car, fussing at him the whole way. I knew she was using Byron as an excuse to come back out and see what was going on. I guess all the laughing and fun we were having made her wanted to join in. Now that she was back, Dad started really cutting up. Well, 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 Mrs. Watson, Dad said, but not to Mama, to Joey. I see your beautiful young daughter has decided to join us, and not a moment too soon either. 
why don't you scoot over a bit and let her in? Joey loved this chance to pretend she was mama's mom. She patted the seat next to her and said, come on in, honey. This is really cool. Mama slid in under the steering wheel with a halfway smile on her face. Wonderful, wonderful, dad said. Byron lifted the record that was already on the turntable and started putting one of his own cool songs on. Put it back, son. You'll get your turn. First, we have a special request from a certain young lady to a certain handsome young man. If you'll excuse me, ma'am, I'll just reach over here and get this show on the road. Dad reached over past Mama to start the car, but on the way, his hand kind of accidentally, on purpose, brushed her chest. Boy, did they think we were blind? Even though Dad thought he was being slick, everybody saw this. Mama puckered up her lips to squeeze down a smile and crossed her arms over her chest. Joetta giggled, and me and Byron scrunched our faces up. Mama did a fakety little slap at his hand and smiled. Dad turned the key, and the brown bomber fired up. Okay, young lady, here's that special number for you. Here's that special number you requested. Dad couldn't help himself and started imitating a disc jockey. Here's the man with the patter. Here to the spin the platter. Why it doesn't matter? Because the world is getting fatter. I'm the man with the tune that'll take you to the moon. That'll make your poor heart swoon. I'll hold you like a spoon. I'm the man with the jive. Byron chirped up. Ain't that the whole natural truth? But dad didn't miss a beat. Put your love thing in drive. Bring your little world alive. Mama slapped the car seat. Daniel, start that record. All right, all right. Dad stopped his rhyming, not because Mama told him to, but because I bet he ran out of stupid poems. But first, let me tell all you people out there in Radio Land that this number was requested by Miss Walona Sands for the wonderful, wonderful man in her life, the big daddy of love, Daniel Watson. We at Flint's Old Soul Station, WAM, dedicated this song to Daniel from Walona. Spin it, ma- maestro. Dad reached over past Mama to start the record player. Joey grabbed my arm with one hand and squealed into her other one. Byron was grinning like a giant, bald-headed kindergarten baby. Mama still had her arms crossed but was starting to smile. She brought one hand up to cover her mouth. My foot was tapping on the brown bomber's floor a mile a minute, and I couldn't make it stop no matter what I did. I guess I was grinning pretty hard, too. Dad's hand touched a knob that had start written on it. But before he turned it, he pulled his hand back and said, first, however, we all screamed, Daddy! Oh, man, come on, Dad, Daniel! But Dad wasn't through yet, and you couldn't rush him. In fact, the more you'd complain, the longer he'd take. He put his hand up to stop the noise. But first, we at WAMM want to apologize to the nine other women who called in, requesting love songs to be dedicated to Daniel Watson. If they stay tuned, we'll play their songs later in the evening. Mama said, that's it, and started climbing out of the car. It was a fun, that's it, though, not a serious one. Dad blocked the door and finally, finally turned the knob that said start. Then he got into the back seat. We all froze. Even the brown bomber seemed to get quieter as the VDLAI arm from the record player lifted itself and moved toward the 45 that was on the turntable. The arm dropped and a hollow little boom bounced around in the car. A moment of silence and then, and then the most beautiful notes of music I ever heard came from the front of the car and the back of the car at the same time. Doom, da doom, doom. Doom, the doom, 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 the doom, doom, doom. The notes were so deep and strong, it felt like we were sitting inside a giant bass fiddle. Mama screamed and put both of her hands over her mouth. She recognized her song after the first couple of notes. The guy on the record started singing Under the Boardwalk, and I had to turn around and look because it sounded like he was right in the back seat with Dad. We sat in the car for almost two hours as everybody got a chance to go in the house and get their favorite records. 
Even though we had a pretty good record player in the house, it couldn't compare with the sounds that came from the scientifically and mathematically put in speakers that the Brown Bomber had. The Ultra Glide cast a spell on all the weird Watsons. Byron was always saying that Mama couldn't stand to see anyone having too much fun. But to be fair to her, I have to say that she stopped us from having fun in steps instead of doing it all at once. First, she thought the music was too loud and made us turn it down some. Then after all of us kids got to play four songs each, I played Yakety Yak all four of my times. She made us get out the car and she and Dad played Nat King Cole and Dinah Washington and other mushball singers. Then she said to Dad, did you tell him yet? Uh Uh-oh. I leaned into the car to get a look at Mama's stomach. This sounded like the way Byron and me found out we were going to get a sister. Everybody's ears jumped up. Something big was going on. Dad wasn't too comfortable with things like this and said, no, it can wait. No, it can't. Mama let the last song finish and said, turn it off, Daniel. Children, in a little bit, Daddy's going to get some vacation time and we're going to drive to Alabama. Grandma Sands is going to keep Byron for the summer, and if things don't work out, he'll stay there for the next school year. This was too good to be true. A long trip in the Brown Bomber and no Byron for the whole summer? And probably for the whole year, because when it came to Byron, nothing ever worked. Byron looked at Mama and Dad with his mouth wide open. We've been telling you, Byron. You've been given warning after warning and chance after chance to straighten up. But instead of improving, you're getting worse. Do I have to remind you of the things you've done just this last year? Byron still didn't close his mouth. Mama started ticking off the things that Byron called his latest fantastic adventures. You've cut school so much that Mr. Alums has come here three times to see what's wrong with you. You've been lighting fires. You've been taking change out of my purse. You've been in fights. You had that trouble up at the Mitchell's food fair. You had that that problem with Marianne Hill. You set mouse traps in the backyard for birds. You fell out of that tree when you were trying to see if that poor cat always landed on his feet. You got that conk. You joined that gang. There's just too much, Byron. We can't ha- have all this nonsense going on. I hope those weren't the only latest fantastic adventures that Mama knew about. I could list about a hundred more. That's why Grandma Sands is going to look after you for a while. You're about to run us crazy. Mama changed the tone of her voice. You're going to like Birmingham, Byron. It's a lot different than Flint. There are lots of nice boys your age down there who you can be friends with. There's lots of fishing and hunting that you can do. There are a lot of better there. I love that city. Your grandma tells me it's quiet in our old neighborhood. She says that that stuff on TV isn't happening around her. It's just like I remember it being. It's safe, it's quiet, and there's no bup head. Mama and Dad had to threaten to send Byron to Grandma Sands about a million times, but we never thought it would happen. This was for three good reasons. The first reason was that Alabama was about two million miles from Flint, and by knew Mama wouldn't let him ride that bus that far alone. He also knew it would be just about impossible for her to sit on a bus with him for three days it took to get there. The second reason was that Mama and Dad were always threatened to do stuff to buy that everybody knew they wouldn't do. Dad had been keeping a countdown on how many more months it would be before they could force him to join the Army, but we knew that they wouldn't do that. But the biggest reason Byron and Joey and me thought they'd never send him to Alabama was because we had heard so many horrible stories about how strict Grandma Sands was. The thought of living with her was so terrible that your brain would throw it out as soon as it came in. Well, Byron's brain had better get used to it. We all knew by the way they'd gotten that bomber ready and by the way Mama's voice sounded that they meant it this time. The big, cool baby finally shut his mouth and ran into the house. He slammed the door as hard as he could, and we all heard him say real clear the S word. Joey said, ooh. Dad started to go in after him, but Mama said, let him go, Daniel. He better get as much of that nonsense out of his system as he can. Grandma Sands won't be putting up with any of that mess. All right, guys, come back tomorrow to tune in to Chapter 9. See you tomorrow.